you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here, Herds, with a book from a man about other men in a time long past. It is The Chinese Gold Murders by Robert Van Gulick. You may remember last week I, I told you what this book was, and you were completely and utterly flabbergasted because flabbergasted this, muxted. this book this Flummoxed. is a Chinese detective story written by a Dutch diplomat named Robert who one day when he was in Chinaland he found some old 7th century murder mysteries and was like wow these seem pretty cool so he like translated them to English lopped off the second half because he thought that it was terrible and published the first half of the stories that he had with, with some with some addendums. So he's sort of publishing it as his own work, but sort of not. But then he was so inspired by this experience that he decided to write sequels and prequels to the this story about Judge D, who was a, a Chinese magistrate in the seventh century solving crimes. We're reading fan fiction then. This is We are. We're reading Dutch fan fiction about China. This is ancient Chinese detective fan fiction. Yeah, pretty much. Written relatively recently in the last hundred years. That's ancient. It, it, basically, yeah. As a, as a young whippersnapper myself, yeah. that's ancient. A lot of these stories were actually written these sorts of magistrate Chinese detective stories were written in the 16th and 17th centuries, but were often supposedly set in the earlier time period in the 7th century. So there's, there's some interesting time stuff going on with these books. But yeah, basically it's fan fiction. And this character, Judge D, is a government appointed magistrate. So there's some interesting stuff going on there. And The Chinese Gold Murders is the fifth book in the series. But it's the first book in the, in the, the cinematic universe. Yes, in the cinematic universe. This is where we find the origin story for Chao Tai and Ma Zhong and really everybody that we care about in the other books that I haven't read. Now, listen, I'm not much of a subscriber to the 12 steps of the hero's journey. I haven't paid my subscription fees in years. I think my, my high school English teacher is still hounding me for my last, my last payment. But I really did enjoy that the like leaving home initial steps just were like stormed through in the opening chapter where it's like, oh, you've been allocated to Peng Lai. Don't go. Life is so terrible in the country. You will have no good time. And he says, no, I need to go on a hero's journey and meet some ruffians on the road that I can fight with my my magic sword. <laughs> I love, look, I love how tropey this book is. At first they're like, we're going to take all your stuff. And like, I'm the brains guy and I'm the tough guy. But then Judge D is like, ah, you are the the green men. And I'm like, is this a Robin Hood thing? Oh, yeah. Is this like, <laughs> like we found our, our um, oh my goodness, Strong strong John. What's his name? Look, we found him on his little wooden bridge. And now we had to throw him into the into the water so that he'll let us pass and then he'll join Judge D as part of his merry band. It's so interesting the way that this reads as like, well, I've got to reintroduce all my favorite characters real quick because I don't, I, I, what am I going to do without them? I love all the, the like side characters. Apparently this is founded in historical context, of course. And this is, this is what I truly love about this book because apparently the magistrate like appointing three of his friends or students or whatever at three or four of his, of his, of his, you know, compatriots as part of his tribunal to assist him in magistrate matters. That's, that's just something that was, that was done back in the day. And the other really important part of the structure of this book is that there are actually three different cases, arguably four going on. Mm, we've got the like tiger in the woods. We've got the old magistrate, and I'm not entirely clear on which the third or fourth are. They had, well, well, that's the, you've already proven my point because the, the the three named mysteries are the case of the murdered magistrate, the case of the bolting bride, and the case of the butchered bully. I mean, we'll we'll learn more about this as we go. But the 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 wear tiger is arguably separate from those other cases. It's very interesting. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of information at the side of the book. Like it it outlines in at the side of the book, it outlines what all the different murder mysteries are and which characters are connected with which cases and which characters are, are not connected with any cases at all, which is a bit of a strange piece of information to give someone. The structure of this book is is very interesting to me 
And the fact that we are getting the origin story of these characters is also quite normal because these books are episodic in a way that they they jump back and forwards in time. So if you were to read these books as they came out, it would not feel strange to you to read something about Judge D's earlier days or Judge D's future days, his future past, if you will. Like we we don't care that much about following his chronological journey through his magistrate career. It's more about saying what is the most interesting place for him to exist in, whether that be Peng Lei or another town that actually existed, for example, and showing him three or four cases that may or may not be connected and seeing how he goes about solving them. This whole thing is very counter to the detective's archetype of working against authority to try and get the real truth. Because like- He's the government. We are following the real authority in the situation. He has a legal responsibility and legal jurisdiction as well over these cases. The struggle here is of a very different scale to what we typically get in detective fiction of the more Western style. A lot of the moment to moment drama is based around the the thug characters as they run around the city and get into trouble and see the specific like clues that lead to the solutions of the crime. Like when they go to visit a boat full of prostitutes and they get in a bunch of fights and Ma Jung's like, let me fight everybody. And it's, yeah, it's a whole thing. I mean, my favorite, my favorite one is when they go to the like restaurant in town and Chow Tai starts swearing at the restaurant owner and the restaurant owner goes, oh my goodness, my old captain from back in the military who saved my life, but not my arm. What a cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> you may have anything from this restaurant for free. Yeah, it's it's cool. Like, I mean, it's very silly, but it does show the connection that these characters have to the town, which I like. And it's something that a magistrate protagonist, Judge G, doesn't really have. He's actually like off screen for a lot of, I, I don't want to say most of the novel. I want to say about half the novel. He's just not here because he's doing his government work And usually when he's on screen, he's figuring things out. He's like actually solving the mysteries that are placed before him. Yeah, it's almost like the the reader's indicator that they have like access to the story now. Sure. Progression of the story. Yeah, I get you. There's definitely some stuff that you can only make progress when Judge D is on screen. Like when we're actually in Taehua's office, his predecessor, looking at the scene of the crime, we can kind of only get those clues through Judge D's eyes. And because we are getting them through his eyes, then they must at that point in some sense be solvable. But then there are other moments where we're checking back in with Judge D, which is basically the acknowledgement that like, yes, the journey that Ma Zhung and Xiao Tai have just been on is complete and you now have a set of information. Go about your merry notes, readers. Pretty much, yeah. Whenever Judge D sits down to talk about what the thugs have just been through, this is Judge D presumably following along with the reader and saying, ah, these are the the clues that you have noticed. I'm going to now attempt to interpret them, which is cool. I, I'm quite enjoying it. it. It reminds me of the old fat detective who I'm- Nero Wolf. Wolf. What a, what a great guy who sent his legs Archie out to do all the clue gathering for him, except that the relationship is less comedic. Well, yeah, because in Nero Wolf, right, Archie does it all because he has to. Yes. And Nero Wolf just (laughs) sits in a chair while his legs run around. Whereas in this, the first things we see is that Judge D is actually incredibly competent. We have a sword fight to open the character interaction of our main cast, and Judge D throws down on a military captain and mm. he shatters his sword yeah. which is like such an obvious you know visual metaphor for just completely clowning the guy like you're, yeah. you literally cannot fight anymore i'm just too good and it's it, it's kind of ridiculous his power level is just too high so we have to follow it's not like in near a wolf where archie is very very capable he just only has legs it's <laughs> it's more that they are two incredibly powerful, three incredibly powerful parts of the same body split up between three persons. I mean, I, th- I think that there's a there's a very telling sequence where they want to go, this is in the most the most recent chapter, or maybe the, the one before it, but they want to go investigate the body of the magistrate to make sure that he's really, really dead because they've seen ghosts. Long story short, there's apparently the, the ghost of the dead magistrate is wandering around the, the tribunal. 
Um, it's why people don't like the, the head servant there. Tang doesn't want to live there because there's like ghosts in the house. I did quite like the sequence where Judge D is just like, wait, you're telling me you don't live inside the secure compound? Yep. Like you're just living across the road in a hotel? It's very bizarre. It's very bizarre. I'd love you to tell me what's going on with Tang once we get to the mystery section. But Judge D decides that he wants to go and have a look at the Magister's body to make sure that he's actually dead, basically. And that's functionally, mystery-wise, that's what that scene amounts to. They go to this, like, monk temple and they break in him and his and his thugs. But he goes there personally because he wants to ascertain that that, that is the truth. And he makes very great care to... to to make sure everybody knows, like, Judge D wants to stay as invisible as possible. Like, he can surprise the criminals with his knowledge if he's not the one who's physically going to these locations and, like, fighting people. Obviously, it's also an excuse to, like, balance out the cast and not have a completely overpowered detective. But, like, in his his own judgment of the situation, he has people to do these things so that he is not seen doing those things. He's not seen solving the crime, right? Because, you know, he's a very public figure, as you can imagine. And if he was the one running around, throwing himself in the paths of swords, maybe the resistance would be uh, a little bit more tangible. He might, I don't know, get a sword to the gut or something. <laughs> that would be unfortunate. I really enjoy the dynamic between the, you know, the protagonist characters in the story. I think, it, as you say, it's very different to be on the the law side of the law because we don't we don't have like a bumbling police chief most of the comedy in terms of solving the crime comes from the thugs themselves which i do really enjoy the the other comparison that i wanted to make to my mind the like having the magistrate's office that we're returning to from each of our adventures reminds me very much of the noir detective getting the case in the dark, dingy office at the start of the story, going on as an adventure, coming back, the case has gone cold, and suddenly something in the office springs to their attention and they go back out again, like having this place to return to. There's definitely a bit of a parallel there. I will say there, there are some mysteries in this book that I think are like, I would say not not unfair to solve entirely, but like there are some mysteries where you kind of, have no clue how to solve them. And then a character will walk into the tribunal. I don't think we've actually had a tribunal scene yet, but a character will walk into the tribunal and say, I have a crime to confess. And they'll just tell you exactly what Judge ne D needs to know at that exact moment, right? Like he'll just learn, you know, the vital piece of information. Yeah, which is very much the wife of the murdered man in a noir story walking into the office and saying that she'd lied earlier, but that doesn't quite get us to the end of the case. There's one more stone left unturned. Exactly, and Judge D has to order his cronies to go and unturn the stone and bring the stone back to him, and then he says, You fools, it was underneath the stone, not the stone itself! The files are in the computer. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we should wrap yep. this part of the discussion here and get on over to the mystery section. Let's do it. I'm excited to see how you go. I will be asking you to solve the how of the murder mystery uh -oh. this week. So good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are discussing the Chinese gold murders, chapters one to seven by Robert Van Gulick. And we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're on 2SER 107.3. Stick around. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here discussing Robert Van Gulick's The Chinese Gold Murders and Herds. Mm. What's up? I have to solve the how of which case? The, the, the locked room murder. <laughs> the locked room murder. If you think you can. I don't know uh, entirely what you think I have to go off at the moment. I don't know that I should tell you. Here's the thing. The presently, <laughs> we have the the previous guy, Taehua. Wang Taehua, yeah. Was, was poisoned in his personal space. Yep. And he was on his own. Mm -hmm. He drank his tea. The characters think that the poison was in the boiled tea water, but not the tea leaves. That's correct. So two of the proposed solutions are that the, the water itself was poisoned with something added or that he was given like a specific set of leaves amongst the other leaves that were poisoned, which seems 
difficult. We know that the tea is poisoned because the trusted doctor fed it to a dog and the dog died. So they're obviously the villain. Uh, I don't think we need to go any further. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a locked room. Like we even are told that the door had to be like smashed open. The the panel had to be smashed in order to get access. There is a narrow window that leads in, but probably not something that you could travel through. And there's a desk and some books and stuff. I would love to know if you think that there is some kind of smoking gun, because I'll let you know, I read through the chapters again just this morning, and I found at least two lines that could two lead lines? you- Two lines? Two entire lines that could lead you to the physical aspects of this uh, crime. Well, at least one of those lines is that he noticed the discolored spot on the ceiling mm. and a few dusty cobwebs in the corner where the tea cupboard stood. What's the secret of the cobwebs? I need to know. Well, it's the it's the spot on the ceiling. Like we're talking about big old heavy roof beams crisscrossing the room, and we notice a discolored spot where the tea happens to be. That has to be something to do with this, right? Okay, that's that's not the sort of thing you put in a murder mystery unless you're going to come back and tell me like, oh, well, it was discolored because the steam would rise up to the roof. Like that this, come on, this is, a, this is a murder mystery. I don't well, need it's, to- It's poison steam, I obviously. don't need to know about the the, a, the generation yeah. of mold. Like, was he killed by mold? Was that what happened? Did, <laughs> did he have a moldy ceiling and mold fell into his tea That's and now it's question. killed a dog? That's a great question. They did say that the, the whole place is in disrepair to some degree. There's this door that keeps slamming. It's a whole thing. The other thing is like, how do we set up whatever this this hole in the roof? How do we set that up? I'd love to know if you have any theories. And if 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 not the how, then then the who would also I would love to know. I mean, it has to be Tang, right? Tang's the guy that's like living across the street because the place was in so much disrepair. He's like, oh, it's such a shame upon me that things are still a mess because I haven't had the chance to clean them up because everything's happened so quickly. It's, sure, whatever whatever lies you got to tell, Tang. Maybe he's just worried about, uh, you know, his professional life. Maybe he's got stresses you don't know about. I mean, maybe he is. Maybe he secured his job by murdering his boss. Because mm-hmm. that's really the most, that's that's the path to job security that I, I think makes the most sense. They do mention that if you, are, if you are caught murdering an imperial official, you could be drawn and quartered. Do you think that this, this Tang character is the kind of guy to risk quartering for a, a cushy nah. job? I mean, listen, if he's got poison, then he's obviously going to ceremonially end himself with poison so that he doesn't have to be drawn and courted. He knows the rules. He's He's got a way out. He's got a plan. I see. I see. Okay, fair enough. I think the other thing in the scene that caught my attention was the, like, wall of bookshelves. Yeah? I think it could be a secret passage or something. Yeah. I don't know about, like, secret passage. I think the bookshelves might be, like, a setup, like, they're obscuring an entrance that someone has used to get in because... You know, it's meant to be like the private quarters. It's set up to be a locked room. And I don't necessarily think that having a bookshelf blocking another entrance quite gets us to like secret passage level so much as the guy who has been maintaining the building probably knows a few more secrets about it than everyone else. Okay, that makes sense to me. So I, I think the, the key thing is, is that like it was trapped somehow and that spot on the ceiling is telling us that the poison was like dripped in from above. I don't know, maybe someone's climbing up in the rafters, but <laughs> I don't know. What, no, what else fair. do you want from me? I want to know about the ghost. The ghost? Do you believe in ghosts? Well, they say that the body they find in the temple at the end is the one that was, like, walking the halls. They do, yeah. It had the same mark on its face. Yeah. And apparently that's also the magistrate who is dead since weeks ago. I guess my question is, do you do you think, you think it's, like, someone impersonating the magistrate? Do you think that the magistrate isn't actually dead? Do you think it's really a ghost? Like, what? what is going on there? I mean, it's it it, it cannot be a ghost, Hurts. Why not? Come Why on. couldn't you, it be you, a ghost? What do you take? You know what? Fine. Do, if if I say it's a ghost and I'm wrong this week, do I lose a point implicitly? No, of course not. Okay, well, it's, it's a ghost. Whole, For this week, it's a ghost. Week. 
Okay, good. I'm glad you agree with me that there are there are ghosts in this book, and this is a ghost. Yeah, it's a ghost. Decided, you know, why good. not? Why not have a ghost in a, in a, in a Chinese <laughs> murder mystery? Do something a little different. We, we're working with the authorities this time around. Why not work with the spirits too? Why not let the ghosts work for the government, and we <laughs> pay them according to their uh, their skill and stature? There's a lot more like going on in this book. I mean, there's always talk about the this were tiger running around. The were tiger like attacks them while they're at the temple. They hear rumors. And when they find out that Fan Chung, who is the chief clerk of the tribunal, he's gone missing or hasn't reported in or something. And Judge D is like, maybe he got eaten by that were tiger. And Tang is like, oh god, not the were tiger. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the were tiger is is a is a crime boss. Okay. You remember you remember Du Yisheng from all the tears in China? It's been a while, but I, I do vaguely remember some kind of orphan boat. That they had to blow up. That sounds right. Yeah, he's like a he's like a giggly vampire. I think was the description <laughs> Solari gave him. That sounds right. A giggly vampire. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I reckon we got that sort of situation. There's a, there's a crime boss here who everyone refers to as the Were Tiger, who's okay. pulling strings behind the scenes. And uh, the reason the reason the Tang is so alarmed is because he's made dealings, and now he's worried his dealings are about to come back to bite him. Okay. So in chapter seven. When the gang are sneaking towards the temple and they hear faint swishing sounds, low grunting, and they talk about how there is a, a terrifying white claw like hand that comes out of the out of the out of the bush, something jumps on Judge D's back. This is a gang boss. I mean it's it's the, 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 <laughs> the, the calling card of the gang. Uh-huh. That they jump on your back and pretend to be a were tiger. Exactly. This is the classic Flex solves murder mystery that I'm here for. <laughs> I love it. Okay. What about what about Per Kai? He sings about the moon a lot. Were tigers are traditionally associated with the moon. Uh, he could be he could be a secret were tiger, don't you think? I mean, if anyone's the were tiger in actuality, like if we are actually having transforming people, it's it's gonna be Tang, which means I'm also gonna need to find a different culprit for the poisoning, to mm. be to be honest. I don't think it's the same person. They could do both. Because I feel like I feel like the precision with which Robert Van Gulick put Tang in a situation where he had to verbally exclaim when people commented on the were tiger was very direct. It's true. He seemed very concerned about that were tiger. I don't want to go with a supernatural explanation because I don't really feel like we have the grounding for it yet, but also the scene in the temple definitely does uh the costuming seems complex to get away with the the scene in the temple. Fair enough, fair enough. Like, we'd be, we'd be doing a lot of magical realism. I do love magical realism. I also enjoy magical realism, but I don't know if I've I've gotten the, the whiff of Robert Van Gulick quite doing it yet. It's okay. I'm, I'm just interested to see how you're feeling right now. Let's talk about something that is perhaps not magical at all, and that's the magic of prostitutes. Yes. So, this Korean girl- Yusu? Yusu, that's the one. Yusu, Chao Tai saves on, on the boat- who, who Chow Tai saves on the boat after saying, oh man, those Koreans sure did get walloped in the war. Don't you yeah. agree, young war slave from Korea? Mm. While he's trying to hit on her. That was a great move. I thought I thought for sure he was going to get himself laid with that one. He may not be as smooth as he says he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, this whole business with this young Korean war slave with this mysterious evidence box that is empty. Yes. It's empty. The seal was broken and we didn't see the seal get broken. Yeah. What's going on there? I feel like the owner of the boat is probably up to some up to some underhanded oh, dealings damn. with the former magistrate. Oh my goodness. Um I'm not exactly sure what those dealings are. Like we had it commented that they had the local brothels moved to barges because it was proving to be unseemly. And all this time, the magistrate who banned them was still coming to visit them. There's definitely some shady dealings going on there. The nature of those dealings eludes me. Yeah, I'm sure we'll find out more about that literally in the next chapter. Uh oh. Possibly. I think the only other thing that I thought was sort of interesting on the Were Tiger thing is is Pokai. They comment on his voice being horrible, and every time he starts <laughs> singing, bad stuff happens in the background. It's true. He's a funny one. I don't think necessarily that he is the Were Tiger or that he's like commanding the Were Tiger, but I I do think in the mystery sense so far, it's interesting that like. He is the harbinger of doom in this story so far. When P that Pokai's fun, and but yeah. he's not presented as such. He's presented like a buffoon. Yeah, 
He's a drunken buffoon and a poet and a vagabond. Like, he's an idiot, apparently. I, I feel like we're supposed to learn something about Tai Hua, the previous magistrate, from him because it's sort of described that their interests uh, overlap and maybe Po Kai is actually the magistrate and he's just decided to retire in a really abstract way. Yeah, he, he, he does seem to be, like, around things important that are happening, but he doesn't go to the tribunal. Who knows what his agenda is, but it's it's clearly interesting. Yeah, like, my my suspicion is thus far having, like, not, not I guess, seriously considered him as a culprit, to be clear. Mm, okay. But I, I feel like as things go on, if he sticks around, he'll be very useful for solving the other, other mysteries. But at the moment, like- it Couldn't possibly be anything criminal about him. I mean, there probably is something criminal about him, but- I don't know if I'm I'm feeling like pinning one of two murders on him. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. What what what's his incentive for for killing? Who knows? What's his anyone? incentive for doing anything? Why does he like the moon so much? It's because he's a wear tiger. No, I think I think <laughs> he just he enjoys he enjoys living his life and is he's you know maybe he put some poison in the magistrate's tea, but he did it for someone else if he did. Okay, okay, I guess we'll find out. Um, I have only one other thing that I want to kind of titillate your brain with. In the magistrate's office, we find that he has he has a lot of stuff in his library. All of these properly bound books that have erotic illustrations in them. But then there's these like books of of, of figures and money that's been balanced perfectly. What's what's going on there? Is the magistrate like secretly a whiz with numbers? He's just like hiding. Is it like a facade? Like what's what's going on there? Was he was he outsourcing his finances, his financial work to a, to a brothel? Is that what the box was? It's an em- empty box full of bills and receipts. That's a great question. And he's 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 somehow he got he got fleeced and he found he was found out and they turned on him. <laughs> I don't know who they is. I mean, the people that run the brothel. We've got the the lady who who beats the girls. Is, does Pokai secretly own the brothels? Is that the, is that the thing? <laughs> is that why he takes? Oh my goodness, he's he's marketing his business. He's surreptitiously getting people to his business through illicit means by attracting them with po- far out with poetry about the Gosh. moon. The moon is a metaphor. The moon is a metaphor for prostitutes. We did it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to leave this brainworm here for next <laughs> week and hope that they haven't just solved it by the time I get here because I don't think I don't think there's enough air time left in this episode for me to unpack what you've just I know driven Look, I'm full sorry. speed into we my brain. We haven't even talked about the guy who gets killed in the canal. We haven't even talked. There's so many uh, things. Was, <laughs> people fall into canals all the time, you know. It's <laughs> right. I'm sure we'll. we'll there's delve too into much that later. going on in this book, herds. I know. There's a lot of disconnected. I connections. feel like I would have broken this up as multiple short stories if I was trying to format it for a show like ours. But Robert Van Gulick clearly did not have the prescience to plan for Sydney Community Radio Station 2SER's well, this is the thing. hit murder mystery program, Death of the Reader. Honestly, if I could have cle- like cleanly separated each of the three mysteries into one episode, that would have been great. But honestly, most of the stuff we've seen has really just been about the magistrate. Has it? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, no. <laughs> So I'm going to have to go listen back to the, this episode. That's hubris. That's a hubris I cannot accept. I know. Oh, no. I need to start taking notes during our discussions. You really do. Oh, you get to miss all my my amazing foreshadowing oh, that I leave for you specifically. Oh, Herds, you're making a yeah. fool out of me. I'm trying. I'm doing my best. Anyway, what chapters are we covering next week? <laughs> I'm just, uh, Okay, we're going to do more Chinese gold murders by Robert Van Gulick, and we're going to be covering... Chapters 8 to 13, because I feel like being cruel. Good good luck solving the magistrate's murder and probably not the other ones. I'm excited for them to just tell me everything that's going on next week. I mean, <laughs> at least one of them is definitely going to just be solved. All right, let's get out of here. Such is You're life. listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We'll be back next week with more of Robert Van Gulick's The Chinese Gold Murders, the I love gold. chronologically first fifth book in the Judge D series. You know what the best part is? No. I don't think I heard you say the word gold once. Where's the gold? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, this is go. two SEO on a seven point three, <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, uh, next, ne next. Where's game. the gold? This is fine. There's no gold. Nobody has introduced any gold yet. I'm sure that the uh, the there's books balance balance books. Mm. De Death of Rita. Two SER. <laughs> Rita dead. S Sydney. Sound and ideas. Listen next week on. Sad.